It's always Hello, the question. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we're, we're looking to see confirmation that we have audio as we welcome everybody. Yay, and that's, that's no reflection on our wonderful engineer, Jamie. It is just that we always tend to start things off, Kanan, with some kind of audio problem. So uh, uh, that just tends to be what happens. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Gray. I am the executive director of World Builders, and we're welcoming you to World Builders Weekly. And who I'm are these Zay, strange I'm people with me? Sorry. <laughs> I'm Zay and I'm sorry is generally how it goes here. I'm also, um, besides being sorry, the director of operations here at World Builders, and we have a special guest with us. Yes, I'm I'm Kanan. I'm also sorry because I'm Canadian. Um, <laughs> actually, I'm not. I'm Australian, but I live in Canada, so I'm learning. Uh, I am happy to be here. Thanks for having me. It's uh, going to be fun. I've been catching up on the last few episodes, so I'm sort of aware of what's coming, but not really. Well, that puts you in exactly the same place we are then. Perfect. <clears throat> um, yeah, we uh, we always start out with some announcements and um, things like that. And the first thing is, I just want to say thank you, everybody. We were able to, um, we, we mentioned earlier on the weekend that, uh, earlier in the weekend, we mentioned last week that we were going to be donating a portion of our sales uh, profits uh, for the weekend to the Paralyzed Veterans of America, the Wisconsin chapter. And um, you all came through. We had some of the best days of sales that we've had in a while, and we really appreciate that. We're still uh, tallying up everything, but we will be making a donation um, to that charity. And uh, thanks for making that happen. Yes, awesome. Um, also, we have GDG coming up. Uh, we have a new video on our IGG.me slash AT slash GDG21. We'll throw that link in the chat as well. I'll probably just do it as I'm chatting here. Hey, hey Control Zay. C. Hey, What's hey, that? Uh, you know, some people are here What's simply that? because they heard that there's a hotshot cartoonist and they have absolutely no idea what GDG is. So uh, so, so what, what is GDG anyway? Uh, upcoming, we have our capacity fundraiser, uh, Geeks Doing Good or GDG. Uh, and capacity, as in it helps us do what we love to do, which is remain a 100% pass-through charity for all of our causes. Um, and this allows us to kind of bunker up with those administrative costs that most charities have, which allows us to pay our people, license creators, and do all the cool stuff that we do. Um, this is also a really cool time where we make a bunch of new awesome products that are either uh, Geeks Doing Good exclusive or come back to the store. Um, and if you guys uh, put in that money, then all of that goes to supporting our efforts and uh, helping out all the other boots on the ground charities that we like to be a part of. Um, if you go to the GDG website that I dropped in the chat, that Beth also dropped in the chat, um, we have a, a new video up and uh, you guys can check out some of the previews coming along as we inch closer and closer to June 21st, I believe. Um, and uh, join us there. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Yeah, we, we are doing, you know, have several different whimsies uh, set up. Uh, we have a new one coming out soon, which uh, working title is The Slow Regard of the Name of the Fear. Um, so we will see how that works out. And I guess that means, if there's no other announcement, we go to trivia. Zay, do you want to take the first one? Yeah. So uh, last week we had a Star Wars question here. Um, the Finn, the stormtrooper who found his conscience in The Force Awakens, didn't have, have a name until he encountered Poe Dameron. Uh, what was his stormtrooper call sign before he looked, uh, before he took on the name Finn? Uh, and the answer to last week's question was FN. 2187. So if you guys put that in any of our DMs, congratulations, you've been entered into the monthly trivia champion prize draw. And uh, hopefully you guys can keep that streak going for this next one. Yes, uh, Gray, I, I'll hand it off to you. 
Well, first we Sorry. have to talk about some uh, particular extra trivia about that. This is not the first time that FN2187 uh, was used in Star Wars. Um, it, this is something that I didn't know, but somebody um, helped us by uh, putting it in the, the extra nerdy comments, um, which is that apparently that also 2187 was also the cell that Princess Leia was held in in the Death Star. So uh, there's a they, they, they do like their numbers. Numerology in Star Wars. That's a book that needs to be written. All right. So yes, uh, you're, you're doing this because I was a child of the 80s. That, that's what that's that's why you're doing this. I'm having wanting me to do this one. So in the 1989 film, Back to the Future 2, a mesmerized Marty McFly takes in the futuristic sights. Now, before I ask the question, by the way, remember, we don't answer this in chat. You send this via DM through any one of a number of our social media challengers, channels, challengers. Um, but the question is, according to the marquee, what movie is playing at the Hollow Max Theater? You can DM your answer by next Tuesday for a chance to be World Builders Monthly Trivia Champion. And by the way, we will be drawing last month's Monthly Tramp Champion shortly, but we all just go back to work today. It's a holiday weekend here in the States, and so we haven't yet uh, gotten it down. The movie was The Name of the Wind. It's what inspired Pat to write the book. Sauce Fire, <laughs> you are fired. Uh, no, that is not, in fact, in fact, you are sauce fired, not just fired. Uh, you know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, that, that was not, in fact, it. Um, but yeah, so I think that, you know, our trivia, uh, as always, we, we love to do that. Uh, and we will be um, bringing you more next week. But in the meantime, let's talk to this amazing person. So it's really kind of funny. I feel like I have known you, Kanan, for now well over a year. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, this is the first time I've actually talked to you even remotely face to face. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Yeah. So it's uh, it's great to actually you know see you in person and, and say hi. Um, Kanan is an Australian cartoonist who lives in Calgary, Alberta, one of my favorite places in the world. Um, and he traveled up there from Australia because they have lots of water and Degrassi. And you yeah. can find his website at Occasional Comics dot com but more importantly we know about him because as someone said this is that guy that pat loves and more to the point this is that guy that pat and oot and cutie love because he makes this fantastic comic strip called max over axe and and how long how old is max over axe like how long have you been doing it mm, i don't know i i think i started in 2010 Wow. Um, it was originally a pitch to DC Comics, uh, Zuda Comics website, and I never heard back about it because I didn't know that behind the scenes, uh, the whole thing was sort of imploding. Um, so when the six month window sort of passed to hear back about whether it was accepted or not, I just started uploading it on its own web page. Um, <laughs> I was quickly contacted by uh, Kwanzaa, who was the editor at the time, and he said, uh, I see you're uploading this. <clears throat> I hadn't kind of got back to you yet. And I was like, well, um, it had been a while, so I figured you were going to pass, but I have another one. So I gave him <laughs> another comic that I uh, started called Major Son about a, a kid who learns that his grandfather was a superhero in the 40s. And he finds the amulet that turned him into this character, Major Sun, and he promptly drops it and it attaches to the dog. And so him and his younger sister have to go off chasing this dog through the streets of Toronto, who is now a seven foot tall superhero with superpowers. Um, that also did not get picked up because, as I said, Zuda was imploding. And yeah, it, mm. it quickly folded after that. But I already had max over acts on the go and within six strips being put up it was getting reviews all over the place and it 
kind of hit like wildfire. I was not expecting it. I had like 20 strips ready to go. And everyone <laughs> was linking to it and blogging about it. And I was like, oh, no, I have to do more. <laughs> <laughs> So I had um, 40 strips of this uh, squirrels and pigeons strip that I'd done previously. And I just put that up as a filler while I worked on more Max in the meantime. But I was not prepared for how popular it would be right out of the gate. Um, wow. That's how it started. And here I am today. I'm pretty sure it was 2010. Boy, that... Uh... <clears throat> that that sounds like a, a pretty um, adventurous journey. And that actually, that was one of my questions just to skip down in the script. I mean, I know it's cliche to say, where do you get your ideas? But <laughs> but more to the point, I mean, th this isn't just getting ideas. Like you have to come up with story ideas on a schedule and then you have to make them funny. And I'm, I'm guessing you don't have a writer's room like off to the side there that you have a, a team working to help you generate things there. Like, uh, no, I carry my writer's room with me. Currently, it looks like this. This is my current writer's room. Ah, uh, notebooks. Toy Story notebook. Um, I have lots of those filled up with stuff. Um, but yeah, they just come to me um, throughout the day. So I always have my sketchbook with me. Uh, the current storyline on the page is a little bit different because it is a 140 page sort of epic where everything has to fit and has a place. A lot of characters have been introduced. They all have to have their payoff and a reason for being there. So I'm juggling a lot of plates with that strip right now. Um, but then once the camp story is all resolved, I can get back to just doing gag -a day stuff. Mm -hmm. But it does have a through line, you know, uh, Max will get older, all the characters will get older, he'll get jobs, they'll have consequences, characters will come and go, relationships will change. So there's things I have to keep track of, but mostly it will just be a, you know, get an idea, write it down and do it sort of thing. Hmm. Um, you make it sound I, so easy. Yeah, I, I couldn't really tell you where they come from. I read a lot. I get more ideas when I read nonfiction than when I read fiction. Can you give an example of a, a nonfiction book that gave you some ideas? I mean, my other job is I do a comic on a monthly basis for Muse magazine, <clears throat> which is a sign. Oh, man, my throat is very dry. <clears throat> it's a science magazine for kids. Um, and I mean, I read National Geographic and Discover every month. It's my basic nonfiction reading. Um, but that's what keeps me sort of able to write for a science magazine. Otherwise, I would probably never have got the job. <laughs> um, but just reading stuff like that. And, you know, you, I, you read an article in National Geographic about, you know, um, ivory trade and stuff like that and you just think oh why don't you just plonk down a superhero in the middle of the story you know and that's the kind of stuff that gives you ideas is it's it's your influences and you just put those influences into whatever it is you're reading um and i think that's what works with max because he's such a strong character i can just whatever i'm reading or wherever whatever i'm experiencing at the time I can just put Max in there and go, well, what will he do? And it, it kind of writes itself. Um, I think the earliest example was um, when I sent him to the dentist. And I think in all comic strips, there's a dentist strip. You know, the characters go to the dentist. You can get a lot of mileage out of that. And I was like, well, I can send him to the dentist. It could be about pain or the drill noise or whatever. And it's like, no, he'll go to the dentist and he'll pretend to be an alien. Because of course he will. And it's just, he's kind of easy to write like that. Because in my advertising degree, which I did, um, we were told an idea is just taking two ideas and making a new one. And that's 
kind of what Max is. You can take two ideas, make a new one, and that's him. Pretty much in a nutshell. Yes. Oh, uh, yeah, I could do that. Um, hang on. Yes, hydration I will get, is something we support. I will get water, I will be right back. Excellent. <clears throat> so, uh, Chair stream. As you Chair guys stream. Uh, can see, though, um, Canon has uh, up some of his comic strips that he's working on. Um, while we're chatting. So um, he might, uh, you know, continue to draw a little bit, um, but we just thought it'd be really cool for you guys to kind of look at what his process looks like um, as we chat. And yeah. yeah, thank you Amity Jam in the comment, in the, in the words. I, I words. also think it, it's funny in that he's, uh, he's already answered a few of the questions that I had written in there. <laughs> Like one of the questions was, is Max going to get older or will this be like Peanuts where, you know, he just stays the same age forever or season 31 of The Simpsons. Um, but he, he will get older. <clears throat> I plan to stop it um, when he reaches the end of high school. Oh, OK. That's interesting. Um, yeah. Oh, but but college theater has so many things to say for it, <laughs> says the person with the dance. Definitely. Uh, seeing you kind of um, relate the likening of Max and the kind of different characters that it offers to the Peanuts. Um, and I've also seen quite a bit of people compare, you know, to Calvin and Hobbes. And I'm curious, uh, how do you feel about like those comparisons? Um, I mean, it's a good comparison, I guess. It's a good strip. I didn't grow up with Calvin and Hobbes because it wasn't in the Australian newspapers. I found it when I was sort of finishing high school. Um, so it's not a huge influence on me um, sort of in the formative years. Peanuts is definitely my biggest influence. Um, but I do love Calvin and Hobbes. It's a great strip unless you sit down and read a whole bunch at once. <laughs> <laughs> You start to go, wow, this kid's very lonely. Um, and I think that's the biggest difference because people look at it, I, especially when I do the shows, you know, they, they see the, the big banner and they look at a few strips and I think they see him, you know, acting crazy and he's always yelling and all this kind of stuff. And they kind of grab that surface comparison. Um, and they say it looks like Calvin and Hobbes, but if you sit down and read it, and I tell people this all the time, it's like, Max is the anti-Calvin. You know, these if these two kids met on the page, they would hate each other. Because um, Calvin <laughs> does not like people. He's very happy in his little bubble with Hobbes. If you read the strip, he has like no friends. Um, it's just him and Hobbes, he doesn't like, well, I mean, he may, may or may not like Susie, we don't know. Um, but Max is the opposite. He loves everyone and he wants everyone to love him. So hmm. I get the comparison on a surface level because he's a rambunctious kid and you know, has a big imagination, but that's as far as I would take it. I don't want to fall into the trap of ever showing his imagination um, on the page the way that uh, Calvin and Hobbes did. Like, I love those strips, you know, when it, it's him and Susie playing the house and it's actually like people, but they talk like kids. Um, or, you know, when Calvin's stomping around the, the library as a dinosaur, stuff like that. I love those strips, but that was, that was his thing. And I've seen so many um, people emulate that and copy it so much. And it's being done. He did it first. Oh, and he did it the best. And there's no point <laughs> in trying to copy it. It's a great um, 
it's a great use of the page. It's a great use of the medium. You know, you have no uh, budget. So has, if you want has you, Max ever done, done cosplay? Uh, I, I'm trying to I'm trying to picture Max cosplaying Kavoth and things like that, but he hasn't <laughs> done it yet. But there are things coming up in the strip that um, I can't give too much away. But this stuff that's certainly been implied in the strip already that if you read it closely, you would know what's coming. Um, <laughs> But he'll get into certain parts of sort of fandom and uh, let's just say there will be comic conventions in his future and all kinds of stuff. So there will be um, there will be cosplay in the strip. Nice. We, we had a question from the uh, chat, <clears throat> which was to ask how you get out of creative block. Um, that sounds like you don't have creative block, but... Uh... Mm. I mean, I have taken five years off the strip, but that was a forced creative block um, when they took the actual literal creative block out of my head. Mm. Um, but I have done a lot of therapy to get over that, where they actually took, you know, neural pathways out of my brain and they've been working to rewire themselves. And they're my psychologist just kept saying the cure for not working is working. <laughs> and I'd always just be like, hey, easier yeah. said than done. Thanks very much for your time. See you next week. Um, but he's like, kind of like saying, just cheer up. I mean, that. yeah, essentially, but he's <clears> turned <throat> out to be right. Um, I brought Max back on March 5th this year after not doing it for yeah five or six years um i was not ready to go i had about 12 strips written um i put up maybe four or five and then looked at the next strips and go wow these are all terrible had to rewrite most of them write new ones um really threw myself in the deep end and i you know I was, there was supposed to be a strip today but I'm still working on that. So I'm already behind, but. You can blame us. We're the ones that are interrupting your, your process, so. I, it's, it's fine. I'm not even remotely, hang on, where is it? It's still in the pencil stage. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, I. it's coming back to me uh slowly but surely and i was really worried about it for the longest time and i just kept putting it off and it's like i can't do it i can't do it i have no ideas i don't know what i'm doing anymore and then as soon as i started uploading them it's all starting to come back so it really is just a matter of working on it when you don't want to work on it um that's when it you know because it is your job and we all have to do the job when you don't want to do the job. So mm -hmm. even when it's something like this that should be fun and everyone's like, oh, that must be the greatest job in the world. And it's like, yeah, that's the key word, job. <laughs> um, so you don't just get to sit back and turn it off and be like, I don't feel like it today. You have to just push through. And I think what you can do is just write something um and just if it's not good look at it again and change one thing and if it's still not good then change another thing and then eventually if it just keeps being not good rub it out write something new and just keep writing and changing one thing until you actually write something that's decent and that's how i get past the writing thing because um, I've had a few strips that need to be done, like they're part of the overall story and it has to be in there. So I can't just forget it and move on. And I've had to write them so many times over and over again. But the way you do it is you just write it and go, no, nah, doesn't work. And you just have to do it again and again and again until you got it. But you can't put it off 
it was like this is the strip for friday it's got to be done now so yeah you just write it once doesn't work write it again but never never scrunch them up and get rid of them because quite often there's things in there that you can use for something else um take bits here frankenstein them into something else later on always going back to my sketchbooks and go oh there was a joke here that didn't work but it'll work here and yeah you just have to keep on going when, when you write down um your ideas do you kind of visualize what that'll um look like in the comic or how do you decide which images to display to kind of convey what you're going for i used to if you look at my old sketchbooks they're all thumbnails um oh if we go way, way back, it's just full of artwork. And now they're just full of writing. Um, they just don't have the time to thumbnail everything. The only ones that get thumbnailed are the ones that have a lot of moving parts. And I need to make sure the characters are in the right succession in the panels so that I know that their speech bubbles will uh, line up correctly. Um, but apart from that, I just write them. Um, and then there'll be certain ones that need a lot of thumbnailing, like the ones I did recently where they were up on the wire rigs because I don't do a lot of action. So to do those ones where they're flying around, pretend kicking each other and stuff like that was, that took a while. <laughs> um, I mean, looking at this, when you're sharing on the screen here, um, yeah, you know, and, and I should say, I'm coming at this not just as a fan, but also as somebody who wishes I could, you know, I, I won't say wishes I could do like we do. I aspire to be able to do comic book writing. And of course, when I say aspire, I mean, I've read a lot about how to do it. I just realized that you have to actually do it. And that's the part I'm, I'm balking at so far. So I'm like, when I look at this, I'm like, well, how do how, what made you choose this particular layout of those particular panels? And, um, you know, is do the panels inform what's going to come next or like zay was asking did you uh do you already have an idea of what's going to be in each one um this one is a 16 page comic that i wrote um with klaus going off on his own side adventure um so the whole thing is written uh because it had to fit in between two strips mm -hmm. um they get to this uh cabin uh, eleanor's cabin and Klaus just kind of disappears and they don't know where he's gone. And then the next strip, he just shows up and he's all disheveled and had this whole crazy adventure. And this is the 16 page story that happens between those two strips. So um, it's all plotted out. Um, it's That's the thumbnail. It is mostly, there's not really a lot of drawing in there. It is all just um, written, but all the panels are there. Um, it would be easier to be doing the uh, thumbnails right now if I did have them down here, but I'm just trying to figure it out as I go. Um, but yeah, the layout is pretty basic. Um, the first eight pages of this story were quite spread out and fun and a lot um, different and quite uh, silent actually, there's not a lot of words. And in the back half of it, there's tons of words and I'm fitting and cramming a lot in. So the panels got smaller and uh, more packed, but it kind of works nicely a little bit. Um, so pacing, uh, I'll show you. Um, so the first ones, they look pretty terrible uh, when they're half done. Um, but one of the things I like to do with Klaus is a lot of the times he doesn't have a lot of dialogue when it's just him. So this was him. He just runs off chasing a chipmunk and gets lost and then has to find his way back. And eventually he falls in the water, which um, that one's see. Uh, 
this was when I was starting to lose my brain a little bit because things like this would happen where he's got his hand um, bandaged up and then he doesn't hear because this was at the stage when I had things going wrong in my brain. I didn't know it. Uh, and it happens now. Um, I'm still trying to get over that. These things just pop up now that I'm working again and I only just realize it. And then this was the page right before the one I'm working on now. So he wakes up having been rescued by this girl and she rocks up in the strip as kind of like a foil for the kids. And Klaus knows who she is because she rescued him from the water, um, but none of the other kids do. Um, so that's that's what I was I'm working on, um, and it's thumbnailed, but not not very well. <laughs> so, do your that's printouts where you use um, pencil is that? Do those just serve just as like a thumbnail for you? And then um, you can do the more refinements. That's my script as well as my thumbnails. Yeah. Hmm. I wrote a script when I worked for DC doing Salador because I had to. Um, they required a script. But when I just do Max, everything's just written in the sketchbooks. Gotcha. The, uh, <clears throat> I love the, the motion. I mean, you were showing the, you know, the images of him going on, you know, running away and stuff like that. And um, the the way that you've worked that um, that dynamism into the the action is something that I like about Max over X a lot of times. When I see him like on a stage, like his body posture, it it makes the shout even more than the um, the voice or the or the lettering in it. Yeah. The uh, you know, it's Where? funny, I, I do the lettering before anything else in my scripts, which huh. I don't think anyone else would do. That is that is interesting. It's almost huh. like the lettering is just as important as everything else that's going on. on I mean, thing. that would make sense because it is so well integrated into the things that, that actually, <laughs> that's a kind of a relief almost. Um, but were you were you a theater kid i mean i i was definitely a thespian growing up and and if my if my mom looked at max over Axe, she would be like why is this guy writing about you gray um so I'm, I'm just wondering you know was that was that you or was it someone you knew or are you just coming up with this fully fledged out of your head uh i was not a theater kid i was very shy um as a kid um I kind of created Max as a way to get my inner thoughts out onto the page. You can see that in things like the one where he's at the coffee shop calling out everyone who's there, like writing on their screenplays and talking loudly about their um, home renovations and stuff like that. <laughs> I have to go with headphones in because a lot of people are very loud and sort of insufferable sometimes it's not not insufferable it just I think the thing that bugs me the most is listening to people when they're wrong <laughs> you, can't, <laughs> you can't interject in there's their, a quote there's the quote of the uh, the day you can't interject Thank in their conversations and go actually it was this person who was in that movie you know so you take your headphones and put them on but Max is you know, he's that inner voice that I can't quite uh, bring out on my own. Um, but yeah, I was very shy. I only started being able to talk in front of the people in university when we had to. I did a advertising course and a large component was, you know, getting up there and actually walking people through our uh, campaign ideas and stuff. But I went from shaking nervously and not being able to say three words together to going up at the end and not having any notes and just kind of jumping around because you know you've got to throw yourself into these things or you're not going to get anywhere yeah well so you said advertising courses that where did you get your artistic training like what was your background in that um i am self-taught i didn't do any 
art classes or anything. I mean, apart from, you know, high school. Wow. Uh, but I just, when I was a kid, I always just wanted to draw. I grew up copying Harvey comics and Disney comics and Archie and just would draw, draw, draw. And then I graduated to copying superhero comics. And then I kind of got tired of just being able to copy things. And then I think in year eight or nine, I just decided this is so boring, um, just drawing other people's stuff. And so I decided to not do that anymore and just draw my own thing. And then I realized I was completely rubbish at drawing. So I had to teach myself everything all over again. And I mean, I, I look at stuff that I was doing in year eight and then year nine. And it's like, is this the same person? Did this person suffer a stroke on summer holidays? Like what's going on? Um, but I just, you know, I went back and taught myself the way of drawing in that you uh, look at things as shapes. You know, that style of drawing, kind of an animator's view where you see the underlying motion lines and circles and squares and that sort of stuff. Whereas before that, I was just sort of that drawing on the right side of the brain drawing where you draw exactly what you're looking at. Um, gotcha. Yeah. Did a question? <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember either, but... um. Did the uh, copying or kind of you trying to map out your own stuff is, I guess I'm kind of focusing on like, how do you capture um, emotion um, in um, your drawings? I wonder. I think, again, it's um, just studying animation books more than anything else. Um, I've never really looked at the sort of how to draw comics, the Marvel way, that sort of stuff. Any um, how to draw books I've looked at have always been animation stuff where you get that more expressive movement and things like that. Um, emotions, I think it just comes from copying what you see, I guess. I am just a big animation fan. So I just pull it all from there, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's a that's a question. Have you have you done an animated? Uh, and apologies if you've done this and everyone else knows about it and I don't. But uh, have you done an animated Max Overacts? I have not. No. No. I don't know if I could ever do animation. I don't have the patience for it. Um, yeah. <laughs> I did a sort of sort of flash storyboard thing for somebody and it took ages it was just mm. um not something i enjoyed doing the same thing over over and over again mm -hmm. um yeah well you did your first book uh, it was a kickstarter right uh it was indiegogo indiegogo <laughs> i've heard of that it was a <laughs> giant mess um kickstarter wasn't available to canadians at the time so mm. I had to do Indiegogo and it's of course that one where you can raise funds and you get the funds regardless of if you make your um, goal or not. And I did not make my goal. Uh, it was about halfway. Uh, so I got all that money and that was great, but then I had to just sit on it and then make the rest up to get the book printed and you know, I don't really make a lot of money. I do a web comic and the occasional freelance stuff. So it took a long time to make up the rest of the money to print the book. So people waited <clears throat> a year for me to get that made. Um, it was a bit of a mess. Uh, but, you know, I got there. Eventually, people were very patient about it because I tried to keep everyone in the loop all the time. Like, you know, transparency is best. Here's where I'm at. This is what's going on. So close, so close. Yeah. But then once the book was done and I had all the money to make the book, then, of course, you've got to scrounge up an extra $4,000 to ship all those books out. 
Yes, we, we're familiar with that. <laughs> yeah, so that yeah. was even more of a hiccup. It's like, yeah, the book's done, it's here, everyone's going to get it soon. And then it was another three months of everyone being like, so where's my book? And it's like, well, I'm just sending them out a few at a time because I'm still <laughs> trying to earn money for shipping. Yep. Oh, yeah, yeah, we uh, yeah. yeah we we actually helped out with that uh, here. By we discovered it was it was easier for us to print it here. Um, yeah, you know when that. Uh, it might not have been so bad if the borders weren't shut down and stuff. Yeah, yeah. the The pandemic definitely did not help when it came to the physical um, aspects of it. Um, aside from the, well, I mean, I I was the, the question I was going to ask is like what. It, was there anything you wish you had known before you went into it? And I mean, I guess, you know, that there was going to be a pandemic might be one thing. Um, and uh, and that transparency is good. But, uh, you know, <laughs> if someone was going to be launching an Indiegogo, what would be some advice that you would give them asking for a friend? <laughs> um, I... Uh... I don't have the best advice because I didn't do much. Huh. Um, I don't have a ton of readers. I have good readers. I have excellent. Um, I don't know how I got them. <laughs> I don't know how I got such good readers, but I've never been a fan of pushing Max on anybody. Um, I don't do really any advertising at all. I just hope that people find it through word of mouth or on their own. Because I feel like if you find stuff that way, you have an ownership over it that people don't have if it's just kind of shoved on them. And, you know, people like throwing things in your face, like, yeah, yeah, get it. Okay, that's great. I'll look at it later. Or, you know, okay, I've looked at it. Now I'm moving on with my life. But if somebody, <clears throat> it's like being, um, it's like walking along and you see a puddle, you know? Um, you jump in that puddle and you splash around and you have fun. But if somebody comes along and splashes that puddle on you, it's like, get out of here with your puddle. Like, and that's where my readers come from. My, I feel like my readers have all found this puddle on their own and they're splashing around and enjoying the puddle. And I think that's why I have such a small readership, but I can do a successful Kickstarter. And I feel like that makes my Kickstarter is a little bit different because I feel like someone who has three times my readership might not make their goal because I have a small readership, but a loyal readership. Right. Um, it's like the thousand true fans theory the, that if you can, if you have a, a thousand true fans, you can yeah. do things, I guess that's the way it goes. Yeah. Yeah. So I, that's, I have nothing to test that theory. That's just a wacko theory that I just came up with on my own. I don't sort of check uh, where my people come from on the website. I don't watch that stuff at all. I don't even know how many readers Max has, honestly. Um, but I did nothing in my Kickstarter. I put it up there. I checked it for the first couple of days to see how it was going. And I let it sit there for the weeks that it had and checked it in the last couple of days. And just watch the numbers go up and up and up. But I didn't do anything. I didn't go on Twitter. I didn't go on Facebook. I'm like, where are these numbers coming from? I, Who is doing this? I, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna push back. And I and I, I wonder if uh, if our listeners would or watchers would agree when you say you didn't do anything because I can think of one thing in particular that you did that I think is probably the most important thing, um, and. Uh, that's simply that you know you you made the product like you made the thing um and that is the most important thing i think a lot of times that that is what doesn't get done is like there's a lot of you know extra extra stuff and, and what you did was you focused on what you knew and what you did and that that's why so many people love this story and relate to it and, and things um uh, there's probably think, lots um, of other stuff about authenticity and stuff like that as well but um, the, the only bit of advice I can give about running the Kickstarter, and I, I know this is counter advice to every other thing I've read, is that bells and whistles, don't worry about it. Um, 
I don't offer anything apart from the book and whatever sketches I can try to fit into my useless time management skills. Um, people just want the book. That's what they're there for. At least that's what I think. I think I might get the occasional person who asks for like a button or a bookmark or something like that. But I think it's the extra stuff does, doesn't help me. It might help other people, but I think people are just there for the, the one thing. Well, we definitely appreciated the, the book plates that you assigned for us, uh, for our, our thing, so. Well, again, that's, um, the book plate is awesome, but that's the sketch, you know? Mm -hmm. The sketch is the, the big draw on the book plate. Although the book plates are very cool, and I, you can probably see them there on the shelf behind yeah, me. Yeah, I noticed those. They, have really a lot they are left. very cool. I'm curious. Um, you, so on occasional comments, um, that's um, for our audience, uh, the location of where Kanan kind of talks to um, people and, and posts um, uh, about his drawings, if you guys want to um, check it out. Uh, I'm curious, uh, do you feel like the directness and the direct interaction that you get to have with people influences your work? Um. I think sometimes it has. Uh, some people have suggested sort of um, what they would like to see in the strip or how certain things would affect certain characters. And it might get me thinking like, oh, yeah, I didn't think about that. So let's see how that would play out here. And I might, I wouldn't do it straight away, but I would probably put it up eventually. Um, because when people react to it and they talk about certain characters and you know ask questions like, well, what about this and why didn't this happen? Then it gets you thinking, you know, well, maybe I should put that in next time. Um, so it helps. There is certainly lots of stuff that I ignore. <laughs> but, yeah, quite back to that authenticity thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you have to know who to listen to and who not to listen to. Um, but everyone who comments on my website have nothing but the best intentions in mind for it. Uh, they're not getting on there and going, hey, you should do this because it would absolutely tank the whole thing and no one re would read it anymore. <laughs> um, so I listen to everything that everybody says. <clears throat> um, but it doesn't change the course of the strip. Um, I've never changed anything based on what anybody says. But, but if somebody suggests something, then I'll add it if it's worth it. Yeah. Nice. Um, just to shift gears slightly, um, one of the things, I, I don't know if you realize this, but I think you are the very first creator that I came into contact with when I first came to World Builders. Okay. Um, cool. Like you, you have been involved in world builders longer than me and longer, I think, than Zay. Um, and uh, I guess, you know, as someone who, as a, as a creator who has worked with us and things like that, if somebody came up to you and said, you know, hey, why are you working with world builders? Like what, what, what is your, what drew you to us? Like what drew you to that, to that group? Why, why would you say people, you know, that, you, that it would be there? Assuming, assuming you have nice things to say. If you have bad things to say, we're going to edit it out and post. But why should people <laughs> work with world builders? Well, I mean, I found world builders because, you know, Pat crashed my website um, <laughs> and then kind of suggested the whole, like, you know, we'll help you out with your next Kickstarter and all that sort of stuff and got me a lot of readers. So that's where I came to World Builders through, from. I don't know what that sentence was. Um, but ever since then, it's like World Builders uh, does great stuff. And I don't know why you would buy from people who don't give back anything. Um, I'm very much on the anti-Amazon bandwagon, as most people should be. Um, I get that some places or some people sell through there because it's their only option and that's 
you know, a revenue stream, but um, I would rather purchase from places that have a conscience and are trying to do good things for the world and spread it around and not hoard things for themselves. I just, you know, it's all about looking at um, the back ends of things. It's like, who are the people you're dealing with? And, you know, world builders is good people. Now I'm blushing. Quick, Zay, <laughs> do, do the lightning round while I recover. We do actually, though, we are getting close to the end of our time. Um, and would you be willing to do a lightning round of some get to know you questions, Karen? Um, yes, I'm sorry I didn't draw much uh, while we were on here. How dare you? It's like somebody was asking you questions the whole time. I know. <laughs> yeah, I thought I'd be able to draw and think at the same time, but I'm not that multi-talented. I can't do that either. <laughs> either um some just uh for a fyi somebody in the uh, chat says they uh shared um they found max through a single shared strip from a friend completely out of context and they just fell in love with it um and so they feel like max is like they're a new adult calvin and Hobbes, and nice. uh they just uh yeah it's nice to hear from those people yeah um That's all right so uh, first question in the lightning round is it can be non-alcoholic, alcoholic, whatever is your favorite, but what is your beverage of choice? Uh, chocolate milk. Yeah. Oh. oh. Or, um, <laughs> That's a or a banana caramel milkshake. Best color. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, and what is, uh, what is your favorite, you know, for comfort food, your meal of choice? Uh, it, it, it's all back in Australia, so, um, oh. yeah, and we went back there last year and I gained like 30 pounds just eating meat pies, pasties, fish and chips, all the stuff that you can't get here, basically. I mean, but you got poutine up there, so. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he sighs, it's not the other, same. Other it's, no, it's not the same. I miss um, I miss the Australian bakeries. You walk in and they instantly have like custard tarts and cherry ripe bars and just the Ooh. stuff that's standard everywhere. And I miss all that. Just an Australian bakery. I want to live on top of one. <laughs> nice. Um, so besides your amazing uh, Max over Axe, um, what is a good read that you would um, suggest to uh, world builders? A good read? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. hmm. I'm trying to think what I've read recently. I, drawing a blank. I'm reading this book to my son at the moment called Amphibian um, okay. about a kid who is obsessed with uh, the death of all animals on the planet and climate change and he's constantly getting in trouble for it and i'm reading it to my seven-year-old because he has anxiety disorder and he's too smart for his own good and uh he's loving that book <laughs> i don't it's definitely not age appropriate but that's, i was gonna say it sounds <laughs> terrifying <laughs> yeah um, I, I mean, that works. That, 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 yeah. That's totally uh, legit. <laughs> the last book that I really, really, uh, that moved me was um, Memoirs of an Imaginary Friend from Matthew Dix. That was great. I recommend that. Huh. It's, um, yeah, made me teary at the end. Uh, it's, I don't know if you can tell from the title, but you, it, what happens at the end is exactly what you would expect, <laughs> but it's good. Um, yeah, Matthew Dix is an author who I think he's a psychologist as well, or he was. Um, so all of his characters have a certain um, affliction. And this one is about a boy who uh, I think he's autistic and he has an imaginary friend. And the whole thing is like, is he real? Is he not? Can't really tell. And it's about, yeah. 
him being kidnapped and yeah it's uh it's wow. good <laughs> all right um we will, we will and I, and I have to go to you know, look at look and see if that's on our libro website um <clears throat> do you have anything that you uh particularly enjoy watching any you know comfort tv or anything like that mm. um let me get all the cool things out of the way like the boys and game of thrones <laughs> um, uh, what else is there all that stuff mandalorian i don't watch any of that stuff <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't have normal tastes. Well, that that's can, why we asked the question is so that yeah. we can we can share them. Uh, um, what what do you like? I like comedy, and people just don't share comedy. It's such a personal taste thing, you know. Um, mm. I just finished watching uh, the whole seasons of Superstore on Netflix with my wife. It's one of the few <laughs> things we were able to watch together. That was pretty oh. funny. A bit mean sometimes, but definitely laugh out loud funny. Well, um, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll throw one at you though, because yeah. it's about, it's a theater group, um, which is called The Goes Wrong Show. I love The Goes Wrong Show. Yes. Yeah. Is there a second season on Amazon? Not because yet. I would, I would re mm -hmm. reinstate my prime just to watch that show. Oh, my, my, that that is, was amazing. That is... I, I laugh cried at every episode. It was fantastic. Agreed. Um, Agreed. Yeah. So if people haven't watched that, watch that. Uh, but I am eagerly <laughs> awaiting the next season of uh, Sex Education on Netflix. And I think uh, the third season of Dairy Girls coming soon. Um, Dairy Girls on Netflix. <laughs> fantastic. And uh, Norseman, I think, has a new season coming up. I love Norseman. That's Say's favorite show. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, Monty Python meets. Um, Vikings, I guess, is how you might describe it, except much more violent. Um, yeah. Uh, I just um, so here's a weird question. Um, something you have in your room with you that would surprise people. Like we all see books and we all have our conception of, well, he must have art supplies and something like that. And then suddenly you pull out a wombat because you miss Australia. Uh, you know. Don't surprise people. Yeah. I don't have anything here that would surprise people. Um, oh, okay. This would surprise you basically just because of its state. <laughs> that might surprise you. Ooh, wow. Simply because. It is not open and not done. So that is the big Voltron Lego Ideas uh, set. And it's been sitting here for two and a half years. And it is my reward for reaching a certain level of doneness with Max over Axe. And I've not reached that level yet. So it's still. Ah, it's motivation. It's still there. there, you go. So, there Nate, uh, there's the other way you get past creative block. You give yeah. yourself a. Uh, dangle a reward in front of you. Yeah, but clearly, two and a half years later, uh, the reward system is useless. I mean, you're still writing. That's, that's it was working. Yeah. No, nobody puts the speed on it. All right. Um, oh, yeah. And, and Zay, did you see I changed the last one, the last question, just to slightly? I did. Um, so if you could sit down. Uh, oh, it looks like my internet is unstable at the moment. So if you guys, if I'm glitching, um, if you could sit down and have a conversation with any comic character, real or imagined, dead or alive, who would it be? And it could be your own. Any comic character? Um, hmm. I think... Maybe Jughead. <laughs> Not of the reboot Jughead, but like original Jughead. I feel like he would be uh, someone fun to hang out with and would have actually interesting conversations. Huh. Wow. <laughs> because, you, <laughs> you know, like the world of Archie's extends way further than um, teen drama and 
bromance and stuff, right? It's like, so what else is going on in Riverdale? <laughs> Jughead would know. Yeah. So, cool. All right. Well, go ahead, Zay. No, go ahead. My, uh, it's getting glitchy over here. All right. <laughs> Um, I knew what that last question was, though, and I was all ready to say Jim Henson. Oh, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I'm happy to know that you were uh, prepared for that uh, yeah. because we generally do. Why would you pick Jim Henson, though, for uh, just the any the general person? Oh, I'm just a huge um, fan of the Muppets, and I feel like he had a unique take on the world that no one else has been able to um uh, copy or match. I think I heard someone recently say that, you know, there's been a couple of people since doing Kermit, or mostly just Steve Whitmire, but now there's a new guy. But nobody can ever really do Kermit because he was Kermit, you know? Um, yeah. So he really was just a singular type of person that will never exist again in the world. And it feels like that's kind of someone you want to talk to. He just was a sort of an optimist, but also he knew all the dark stuff in the background, but still chose to be an optimist. So yeah, great answer. Wow, that'll teach me to muck with my last questions. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Kanan. Um, as we said, you can uh, see Kanan's uh, comics on, on occasionalcomics.com. Um, and we are going to be offering uh, a special double uh, dual pack of his books during our upcoming Geek Swing Good Showcase that starts June 21st. So uh, stay tuned for that. And um, always you can check out uh, World Builders Market for other items that we have that uh, help us continue our work uh, here at this charity. And uh, Kanan, we have had a really great time talking with you. And it's always been a pleasure. You know, it's always fun when it's someone who we have liked for a while, and then we meet you in person, and you're even cooler. So thank you so much for joining us here. Yeah, no worries. Thank you. I've had a, a good time. All right. Yeah. And uh, as you know, from watching it, we, uh, we do our sort of ritual sign off. Uh, we have a name and um, I, I think that it would only be appropriate to say that the final word today is Maximus. <laughs> Brilliant. Right. I like that one. Yeah, there, there it is. It is. Right. Thanks guys. <laughs>